Check it out. It's the Laugh to Learn podcast. What is going on, everyone? Welcome to the Laugh to Learn podcast, the post-election conversation. My name is, as always, Jacob Paveo, and I come to you from the Great White North each and every Wednesday afternoon, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, which is about to change because the clocks are going back in a couple weeks, which means the snow will soon fly. Uh, We have a huge rainstorm we're dealing with this week and i am going camping this weekend and it's still supposed to be raining so that's gonna be uh quite fun it's all right though because i'm only going with the dog there's no uh other people to worry about and listen to them complain i'll just be complaining to myself without electricity so uh, i guess that's what we call fun here in canada uh as always you guys know that uh, you can subscribe wherever you happen to get the podcast we're posted everywhere uh of course we are on podbean our home platform uh we are over on spotify apple podcast they call it now uh the google play store um, just about everywhere else, you know, that you can you can possibly listen to a podcast. You can listen to us. And thank you all to the new listeners. Our numbers are spiking and spiking and spiking every single week. Uh, I feel like it, you know, it's got a plateau here and then we go a little bit higher. So it's pretty awesome to see the reaction to the podcast lately. Thank you all so much. Of course, uh, you can feel free to contact me using any of the social media links in the description or using the contact page at www.laughtolearnpodcast.com. And of course, you can check out the merch store while you are there. So it is post-election week. Uh, it happened on Monday of this week. Everyone went out to vote. They masked up and got out there and ticked those boxes. Now, I have to say, uh, I'm quite content with myself because I thought this was going to be closer than it was, uh, but I still did predict a liberal win, uh, a liberal minority win, and that's where we are at, which means to date, since I've been on radio uh, in 2012, uh, so we're going on nine, (laughs) ten years now next year, which makes me want to jump back in time. Actually, no, it doesn't. That's not even true. Uh, But uh, I have success predicted all but one election which is pretty sick of course the one I got wrong I thought Donald Trump would of course beat Joe Biden uh, but that didn't happen Um, which is a good thing I shouldn't sound negative when I say that Uh, but either way on Monday this week we saw the liberals uh, control a a minority government it seems at this point there are still uh by my count there are 13 polls that are still undecided they're still counting votes and they are too close to call but um we do know for sure at this point in time the liberals will hold at least 150 seats but it appears that they will hold 158 there are eight districts they are leading in Um, The Conservatives at 117, uh, which is a total of 119 seats because they are leading in two more districts. The Bloc look like they're going to close out at 34. Uh, The NDP look like they're going to close out at 25. And the Green Party, for sure, will close this election with two new seats. Now, there is a lot to discuss about this election, but... Uh, I kind of wanted to stay more top level. Uh, We'll get into some of the minutia, but as everyone knows who's been listening to me for a while, uh, hello, Bennington. The dog just came over to me. That's the clicking in the background if you heard it. His, actually, he needs to cut his nails. Uh, But um, the, the big thing to discuss here, I think, is the performance of the Liberal Party. Because going into this election, Everyone, all the momentum was with the liberals. Everything looked great. And then they tanked. 
And it seemed for a little while going into and leaving the debates, the conservative party was leading, but as always, I've said this for so long. This is why I always complain about moderators in the debates because the debates are the most important part of any election. I absolutely i don't care you can knock on doors all you want it doesn't matter uh, which a lot of my friends who work in politics adamantly disagree with me and that's cool if you're listening to this podcast uh and you disagree like that's cool but the the debates are viewed so widely now in soundbite clips across social media that that is where you win and lose elections and there is no doubt that the conservative screw up on gun control and the conservative screw up on uh, uh essentially the 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 gas the gas line running through quebec uh they you know by um by aaron o'toole refusing to say in the english debate that he wouldn't have a gas line run through quebec because he said it in the French debate, remember? Uh, And then uh, when he was asked to repeat it in English, he avoided the question (laughs) and did not do so. Um, That really lost all of their momentum, all of the Conservative Party momentum in Quebec, uh, and then doubled down by basically releasing a gun control um, uh, bill or proposal, I guess, platform, however you want to describe it, um, that was very similar to the Liberals, which included uh, banning uh, some weapons which have been identified, labeled as assault rifles, although if you know anything about guns, they're really not. Um, it, it's it's just like the conservatives shit the bed here. Aaron O'Toole did. And that's what I've been saying from the beginning. I mean, the one thing about Justin Trudeau, as much as people love to hate on him he really knows how to run a campaign he really knows how to be a politician and he's very good at it and you know somehow the uh, the liberals ended up coming back from behind and really taking over now an interesting thing here is that the liberals as of now actually have fewer votes across the country than the conservatives Uh, I've seen a lot of people talking about this, but I think it's important to note how dominant the Conservative Party is across Western Canada. Really, in Ontario, uh, you know, in Quebec, these are all the, the heavy populated areas, and they are very competitive, like very competitive. Even though around Toronto and in the GTA, you see a majority of people... Uh, or, or of ridings rather going to the liberal party it's still super competitive and it wouldn't necessarily be surprising for a few of those districts to have flipped conservative at any any random during rather any random election and so the so at this point in time the conservatives have 5.4 just shy of 5.5 million votes across the country and the liberals have 5.2 million votes across the country and this is the the issue that i brought up back in the day when people were complaining because hillary clinton received more votes across the country than trump and i just need to remind people to play the right game right so the conservatives dominate across the prairies they dominate across central canada there is no liberal presence there is a very minimal block presence there's obviously no green party presence you're never going to win on that platform in oil country Um, and of course the block don't exist outside of quebec so there's no one running against the conservatives essentially of any real threat in almost every single district across the prairies so it is not surprising and that's why i'm bringing this up just to say that it's not surprising that the conservatives received more physical votes across the country but still ended up in a loss because you have to think of it like this right of course uh we vote by riding whoever gets or by uh, district uh each district you get one seat uh that seat counts towards the federal parliamentary count. Uh, If you reach 170, you have a majority. If you beat everyone else, you have a minority. And that's where the liberals are now. But when the conservatives are receiving 100% of the vote or near 100% of the vote in a number of districts across the prairies, their overall vote total goes up. So it's actually not 
impressive and it's not something that people should focus on i've seen a few people online talking about it and i just wanted to address that point here now the other thing that i wanted to talk about when it comes to the election is based solely around the liberal result because a lot of my friends i mean it's important to note and i've talked about it before that i live in a very conservative urban center it's rather unusual in, in, I mean, not only Canadian politics, but world politics, that it happens to be that way. Um, but it is a conservative dominated city. Um, and yeah, it's unusual, but it is what it is. A lot of my friends are hyper conservative and they all vote conservative and they are all mind blown that the liberals have the kind of support they do because people think that Justin Trudeau is literally the worst politician. For some reason, they don't remember Kathleen Wynne, uh, and <laughs> they forget that it could be much worse. Um, but they, uh, and that's someone who voted for her in the very first uh, election I was ever able to be a part of was a provincial election, uh, and I voted for her, and that was a dire, dire mistake. Um, but anyways, <laughs> moving on from Kathleen Wynne, um, if you were on the internet at all, you would have thought that the conservatives had this in the bag and the liberals had no chance. And it's just it's just a fact of the matter. And people like to say when analyzing US politics how much hate Donald Trump and the conservatives get online. A lot of people like to say that young people dominate the internet and young people lean liberal, they will always attack conservatives. It's clearly not the case here in Canada because overwhelmingly, the attacks online go against Trudeau. If you read through Twitter, if you search Justin Trudeau on Twitter, it's all people hating on him, right? It's 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 the basically it's not equivalent because the numbers are nowhere near there, and he's not the sort of character that Trump was to garner that kind of uh, uh, anger. But it is in a Canadian concept comparable to how poorly Donald Trump performed online. And when Trump won, people were mind blown. How did he win? It's because you're living in your online bubble. And the same thing is true of Trudeau. And this is what I've been trying to tell, like my friends are like mind blown. Forget about the fact that I said on Monday, that, or on, sorry, that on uh, Wednesday last week that I would be supporting the liberal government this time around. Um, and I thought, that given the choices, they were probably the best party to lead simply because of how poor a leader Aaron O'Toole uh, is and how I don't think Jagmeet Singh could perform uh, to the level of a competent and confident leader um, on the international side of things. Um, again, <laughs> just the picture Jagmeet Singh sitting in a room with Vladimir Putin, like, Putin would bring in white people dressed as black people and he would cr have to cry. Putin would like bring in some random, I don't know, like slave child, slave labor child and Jagmeet Singh would have to cry. It would be this whole thing. It would never work. Um, so what we end up with is how could the Liberal Party have done this? So many people are asking me that. It doesn't make sense. Look online. No one likes Trudeau. Talk to people. No one likes Trudeau. The problem is Trudeau is absolutely adored around this country and around the world and it's really like you know it's one thing to say like he, you know he obviously had endorsements that weren't technically endorsements from obama and hillary clinton and joe biden and you know uh, um, big players like that jagmeet singh had bernie sanders who online is more popular than all of those people except obama Right, he is a super popular figure among young voters. Bernie Sanders is, and Jagmeet Singh. You would have expected to have a fantastic showing if you get Bernie Sanders, right, the runner-up in two Democratic national conventions in the last two U.S. elections. Um, you get his endorsement. That's a big deal. Well, the NDP did very well, right? They're getting 25 seats, it looks like, guaranteed 24 and leading in one right now. And it, that's a fantastic result for them, but that is not Bernie Sanders' level of support. So it's easy to look at international support for Trudeau and say, ah, they're Americans, 
you know, it doesn't really matter. There's also been some some big figures around, uh, like European politicians and such, uh, providing similar um, similar comments, let's say, uh, in favor of Trudeau winning, uh, or 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 ga- giving him their support, I should say. But that all is super important because when you're voting. Most people don't listen to podcasts like this, right? Just being honest about it. Most people aren't that involved in politics. Some people will read a platform or they'll listen to, you know, my my episode on the party platform, which uh, as I predicted when I did that episode that it would be the biggest episode I had ever done. It was, right? Those sorts of things. People will be like, oh, I want to know, you know, who should I vote for? I'm going to listen to some different people talk about party platforms and get some ideas. And that's all fantastic. But the problem is most people aren't listening to my show every week. And that's not only a problem because they're not involved in politics, um, but they're also not listening to me talk. And I would love it if everyone would. So double whammy sort of issue. But when you're not completely absorbed in politics, and I mean completely absorbed, like if you don't, if if you hear about SNC-Lavalin and you think like one of my, one of my friends I was talking to yesterday, he was like, Justin Trudeau broke the law. And I was like, well, what did he do? And they said, I don't know. It was that thing with that company. And I'm just like, yeah, okay. Because if that's all you know about it, then you can't, you're, you're not actively involved in the discussion. You weren't involved in it back then. And you're not really up on it. Now, I'm, I've am i said it before. I am not defending his SNC-Lavalin choice. Uh, and, you know, Jody Wilson-Raybould, definitely uh, her stepping down. I, I Unfortunately, I had mentioned I pre-ordered her book. It got canceled because, of course, they sold out even though I pre-ordered. And now I can't get it till like, October 25th. Uh, so... Unfortunately, I haven't read her book yet, and I don't buy uh, ebooks anymore because I'm like building a library, and it's pretty sick. It's a library that's like a bookshelf high right now, but it's going to be a library one day. Um, so, what it comes down to is, if you're not actively involved consistently in politics, you seem to get really surprised when you don't understand the result, right? And the liberal government, as a whole, have really, uh, uh, this is obviously my opinion, but they've really overperformed from what anyone says they should have been able to do with the pandemic. It did take a little bit longer for us to get uh, vaccinations. People are upset because Canada is the only G7 country to have a shrinking economy in the last quarter, right? But the Canadian economy rebounded faster than almost every other nation primarily because our economy isn't based on tourism like tourism is it's a big part of our economy but it is not substantial like it was to the u.s um and and like the hit that the tourism economy took in the u.s on top of that we are already exporting all of our 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 um, natural resources it never slowed down except oil some of the oil fields are, are completely closed but Um, most of our natural resources are still being extracted and sent out of the country, and the economy has not slowed in those areas. Uh, The service industry has slowed, but again, it was never a significant part of the Canadian... I shouldn't say it wasn't significant, but it was never a driving part of the Canadian economy. Um, You know, so as of what the federal government did economically with CERB, although... I disagree with how easy it was to collect CERB. Clearly, the expense paid off. And you have to realize, millions, tens of millions of people received a check every month that only two parties supported. And a little bit, and the the bloc as well, but two national parties supported the Liberals, NDP, and the bloc were the ones who really supported it. And I don't count the Green Party because I kind of consider them as independents. So what this comes down to is you had Tr- Justin Trudeau's Liberal government paying people for the last two years, and then you wonder why they voted for them. 
Like, they've been receiving a check from this liber liberal government for two consecutive years, and the conservative government would have taken that away from you. Well, I mean, it's ending anyways, but they would have done more to ensure that you will never get similar programs like that starting. That scares people. That's a major thing that no one discusses because to them, CERB is done. Legalization of marijuana, I talked about it last week. I think people undervalue how significant that bill was. And again, you only had, you only had because this was when the liberals had the majority, they didn't need the block, and the block were not in favor of complete legalization of marijuana. It was just the NDP and the liberal party, but the liberals were able to do it with the majority government. And so that's the sort of thing that people don't forget people who are loosely linked with politics don't forget those sorts of concerns they are the things that are most impactful to your life the fact that you're not going to go to prison for smoking weed and you're getting a check every whatever it is every two weeks or every month i've i've no idea how sir honestly i don't know how they get paid out um i'm assuming it's it's every month but i could be wrong and but either way you're getting a check from this government that is so so important to so so many people and they were definitely thinking about it when they went to vote a hundred percent they were thinking about it so to me it's not a surprise at all that the liberals won it's not even surprising in 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 retrospect initially i did say i thought they would go from 155 to like one 45 or 150 seats and I thought the NDP would do a little bit better than they actually did uh, but in the end the liberals pulled it looks like an extra three seats to reach 158 and you know retrospectively it makes sense when you take those two things but especially Serb into consideration because most people are not inundated with politics right people who don't like Trudeau watch politics constantly and typically if they were already going to vote for Trudeau but now they're not they're not going to vote for Aaron O'Toole they're going to vote for Jagmeet Singh which is why I think the NDP did better and it's also why I thought they would do a little bit better than they actually did because I figured they would take those votes not the conservative party for some reason, I have heard some friends who were previously uh, Trudeau voters and liberal supporters who went towards Aaron O'Toole because he was a little bit more of a centrist, um, but uh, those are few and far between. Most of my friends who were liberal voters that are aware, well aware, I should say, because everyone's kind of aware that Trudeau is a little bit of a snake lately, um, but who are well aware of the... Uh, the flaws of the liberal candidate, they all went to Jugmeet Singh and the NDP. So I, I don't really know why people are shocked that the conservatives didn't pull out a, a minority. I'm, I'm, I'm not so surprised that, pe that people are surprised they didn't do better, because I also thought they would do better, but I never thought they were pulling the minority. And even if they did, I talked about this before, the Liberals and NDP would form a coalition to take over anyways. Uh, so the Conservatives had, in my opinion, no chance of leading this next government. And my message to people, because as I said, you know, podcast numbers have been up. I'm probably pulling in some folks who are specifically interested in the election. And so I think it's worth talking about this now. Don't, you don't have to be completely inundated as myself with politics constantly. You know, you don't have to be at work with, you know, a podcast playing in one ear talking about some intricate, you know, whether it's Canadian or American policy and law debate and, you know, stuff like that. You don't have to be that consumed. But I encourage people to be well aware and well involved in politics as a whole. Because what it does, you know, a lot of people get stressed about it. They don't want to discuss it and they argue about it and they fight about it. But at least I can't say what it does for everyone. But what it did for me was it gives me the opportunity, especially with this podcast. This is what I, I 
aimed for when I started the podcast back uh, two and a half years ago now was to, to give a platform for myself to work on understanding all sides of an issue and to be understanding of everyone. So, you know, I'm not a lawmaker. I don't really want to be. <laughs> I did when I was younger, don't really want to now. Um, and for me, it's not about convincing any one of my opinions, right? It's, it's not about me trying to tell you all who you should vote for. If you voted PPC, I'm super, super happy that you know you voted for a party that you truly believed in and maybe a specific candidate or maybe it was Maxime Bernier, maybe it was something with the, the masks or vaccines. That's what you believe in, you know? It's also why I haven't ever touched the protests for anti-maskers. I actually, believe it or not, as and this is, I've talked about it before, like I'm hyper-liberal, uh, this, is something that I don't have an issue with. I think you should be able to to um, debate and protest uh, any law that you want. I don't understand how we have untouchable laws. You know what I mean? That doesn't make sense to me. Or untouchable rules or, or whatever the case may be. You should be able to openly debate it and, and protest in the streets, um, you know. Uh, I don't think you should be walking into businesses breaking that rule uh, as a means of protest, that doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, but I have no no problem with uh, with active protest and whatnot. I, I try not to touch it because I know it's a very toxic issue and people feel very strongly one way or another about both vaccine and mask mandates. I have been a little bit more vocal of my liberal position on vaccine and general man, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, the the va vaccine mandates, not only for COVID, but vaccines in general. I did an episode on a few years ago on how I have no problem with general booster shots and stuff being mandatory. Um, but, you know, I, I, I came to a position by constantly following politics and by constantly listening to right-wing politicians, right? And I actually hope that a lot of my listeners are more conservative because I think I can explain the liberal position really well and I, I, you know, I do my best to explain conservative positions, but it's a way that you can challenge yourself, right? You can look at this as someone who thought Trudeau should have been stomped in this election. You can look at this as a challenge to yourself to understand why Trudeau was reelected, which I think, uh, at least I laid out my position on why he was reelected, um, not to a majority, but to a minority. Um, and then you can use that, you know, you can actually use that as a means of getting your, your prerogatives through next time. You know, I use them because I think it's fascinating. I can look at this information for hours and hours and go over it and whatnot. But, you know, if, if you are having a discussion with your friends about who to vote for or whatnot next time, by knowing why they voted this time the way that they did, it can really help you to have those discussions not not only not turn into a fight, but be more fruitful. Get more information out of people because you can find out how they feel about all the nitty gritty issues. You know, I talk a lot to a lot of people who really don't, I, I wouldn't say don't care about politics, but they're really not invested until a specific, a specific rather issue shows up and then they get overly invested. That's kind of how elections are to me, in my opinion. Um, and to me, that's like so concerning because it's like, you know, if you look at this, the Texas abortion bill and how obviously important it is, especially to people in that state, you know, you need to be able to enter that argument if you're talking to someone who supports the bill, you need to be able to enter that argument knowing full well everything about the abortion debate. You need to be prepared for it. Because, I mean, don't get me wrong, the Texas bill, really hard to defend. I haven't really heard adamant defenses of it. And I've heard a lot of super pro-life people even be like, yeah, this is a little, like, probably illegal. But uh, we're going to find out because it's going to the Supreme Court in... Um, I think in December. 
Um, but it's the sort of issue that gets people really uh, excited. They really want to get involved. But because they're not actively involved, someone who has a different opinion of you can just tear you down easily because they're always reading about it. They're always watching and they're always listening and thinking about it. So what I ask of, you know, my fellow citizens, <laughs> citizens of the world, because we have listeners from all over, shout out to everyone the world over. Um, uh, pretty much, actually, I think scrolling through quickly uh, earlier this week, all of our listeners are from a democratic nation. Uh, we do have an active listener in Russia. Uh, shout out to you. It's debatable whether or not it's an, a proper democratic nation, but you can still cast a vote. So, uh, so we have an opportunity to at least passively keep an eye on what's going on politically. It doesn't have to be my, my show. It doesn't have to be, you know, the six o'clock news but what I did when I first started getting really interested in politics was I picked one person who I enjoyed listening to. I enjoyed the conversation, and it wasn't specifically politics. Uh, I won't use the dude's name, uh, but it was actually I, a friend of mine told me to listen to a video game podcast that he had appeared on, and... Uh, that's where I found him, and I thought he, he's uh, super conservative, or was at least back then, and I came to a position where I was listening to what he was saying, enjoying the way he he gave his opinions, and I wasn't mad listening to the other side. <laughs> you know what I mean? I wasn't getting frustrated by it. And I think the problem with politics today is the news is designed to frustrate people because if you're either angry or scared, you're going to keep watching and listening. That's not what I try to do. Honestly, like I don't care if my numbers drop back down to 10 every week, which they were at for a long time, right? It doesn't bother me because I'm just doing what I love to do. I'm not here to keep you on a hook, keep you listening, you know, win your vote next time. No, I just want you to be aware of what's going on in the world and have fun doing it. And if you can find one show, either either television, podcasting, uh, you know, on the radio, whatever it happens to be, and you know, once a week you spend an hour just getting caught up on everything. And I don't even care if you're watching The View one day a week. Like I really don't care, as long as you're getting it, getting some form of political information and. People are terrified of you listening to the other side. They don't want you listen. You know, liberals don't want you listening to Fox. Conservatives don't want you listening to uh, MSNBC and whatnot. In, um, obviously, using major American corporations here. Um, but I think in reality, you just have to do whatever works for you. For me, I prefer to listen to right wing people because I already know how I feel. I read everything. I'm aware of everything going on. I know the left's opinion on it. It's my opinion on it. So I don't need to hear someone yell it back at me. So I listen to other people. But maybe you you get frustrated by listening to those other opinions. Then don't listen to them. Find a liberal news source, maybe even a hyper-liberal news source, right? You just have to be aware that you're listening to some spin. You know, they they may be avoiding some stories. They may be promoting other stories that aren't as big a deal just because it makes them sound better or makes the candidates they like uh, sound a little better. But once you're aware of that and you find something you like, it's only an hour a week. And that's what I challenge people to do. Um, because although I have no problem, you know, responding to, to friends and, and fans who are sending, uh, you know, random questions really about the election, about the liberal win, a lot of people were shocked about it. But I think if you were spending an hour a week just following what's going on and, and the trends in politics, especially over the last month, right? If you heard, uh, which I didn't even talk about on this show, the, the gun control issue uh, that the conservatives uh, ran into. Um, but if you were aware of the gun control issue and if you were aware of the pipeline issue with Aaron O'Toole and the English debate, you probably would have had a good idea that they weren't going to overperform. <laughs> they weren't going to show up and seem like uh, a fantastic option. Uh, they weren't going to show very well in the election. 
And ultimately, that was the case. So, I guess I want to leave this episode on a positive note of of opportunity for the future. Because if you enjoy if you enjoyed following this election and maybe you didn't enjoy the outcome or maybe you did, you know, and and you want to follow through with it because if you cared s- enough to, you know, some people were waiting in line for hours to vote, you know, if you cared enough to get out and get involved s- and do that civic duty, you probably if given the opportunity, would care enough to follow what's actively happening in politics. And the fun thing about especially Canadian politics is we get long periods of time where nothing interesting happens. That's why I talk about the U.S. so often on this show, because Canadian politics takes long breaks and stuff like that. It's pretty sick. <laughs> nothing happens for a long while at, at times. So it's easy to follow uh, what's going on it's easy to understand what's happening. Uh, and I want to mention, because people are saying that the Liberal Party may be underperformed in this, really important to note is that when you combine the Liberal seats and the New Democrat uh, seats now, uh, the two of them together control a majority, so they do not need the Bloc or the Green Party to or any independents to agree with them on anything to pass legislation through. So now... Uh, we are going to see a step back from the more central um, or, or, or center-directed policy that we've been seeing, uh, driven by the Bloc, because they needed the Bloc Québécois votes to reach that majority before. Um, and now they don't need that. So I think we're going to see a big shift. The NDP have a lot more power now. Even though they're still down at only 25 seats, the Liberal uh, the liberal government needs them to vote uh, to get that majority. They could use the bloc in some bills, and I think they probably will if the NDP disagree with a bill. But I think the NDP just gained a lot more power than they've ever had federally. It's not being very actively discussed. But to me, it's quite clear that the Liberal Party is just going to work with the NDP. Jagmeet Singh and Justin Trudeau get along very well. Uh, The NDP love Jagmeet Singh, and they're not changing him as leader. And I think the two of them, Trudeau and Singh, are going... I I wouldn't be surprised to, to see an NDP member put into cabinet. In fact, I'd like to see it. Um, I don't know for sure that it will be, but it wouldn't surprise me Uh, just because of how important the NDP vote suddenly is um, in the House of Commons. So that's where I'm going to leave this episode. Um, I hope everyone uh, kind of makes a a point. I mean, obviously, you're listening to my show right now and you're clearly listening through to the end because here we are at the end, Uh, but makes a point moving forward of staying actively involved And trying to get your friends actively involved because politics doesn't have to be an argument. It doesn't always have to be a debate. It doesn't have to be an aggressive, um, combative sport. It's simply the reality around us. And, you know, even when it does turn into debate, it can be done respectfully. It doesn't have to be personal. There's no reason for you not to be friends with people who have absolutely different opinions to yourself. Really, like, I don't, you know, if your friends don't want to get vaccinated, you should probably still be friends with them. If your friends don't like wearing masks, you should probably still be friends with them. It's not really reasons to cut people off. Uh, You know, if they voted for the People's Party of Canada or the Bloc or the Green Party or whoever, right? Some random independent biker who wanted to make cocaine the uh, the new Canadian dollar. It doesn't matter who they voted for. I just made that up. I don't think that guy exists, but you never know. Um, you know, it just across the board, politics should never come between a personal relationship. Uh, and I hope moving forward we see this uh, continued acceptance of all perspectives. Um, and I hope each and every one of you have a fantastic week. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. 
Uh, of course, if you haven't done so already, hit that subscribe button. You know where to find it, wherever you happen to be listening. Don't forget, we'll be back each and every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here, fresh for you to download and listen to either on your way to work or perhaps after work or on the weekend, whenever you want to listen to us. You can stream us on Spotify. You don't even need to d- hit that download button if there, you don't have space on your phone. I'm actually running out of space on my phone because I have all episodes of the podcast saved on there, so i got to go through and wipe some of those. <laughs> um, but either way... Thank you all so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic week. Don't forget to keep sanitizing your hands, keep washing your hands, keep getting those vaccinations, keep wearing those masks, keep social distancing, keep on laughing, and keep on learning. 